This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Well, it is here. Are the doom and gloomers right? Is this the beginning of the end? We saw three banks collapse last week, and there are some signs that we have significant concerns in the economy. However, I don't think it's nearly as doom and gloomy as all of the doom and gloomers like to say. Remember, we are in a world where sensationalism and clickbait gets all the attention. So we're going to take a realistic look at these bank failures. We're going to take a a deep look at Silicon Valley Bank, of course, the second largest bank failure in U.S. history. And we are going to talk about what you can do about it what it means for the future of interest rates, what it means for the real estate market, what it means for real estate investors, and how to protect yourself. So make sure you stay to the end of this one. There is a lot to cover here, and we've got even more upcoming interviews with experts. I'm recording one later today regarding this exact topic. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. Okay, so you all saw the movie Margin Call probably. I recommended this movie. It was fantastic years ago, and that's pretty much the kind of situation we're in with these bank failures. Okay, so the fear here is not really about Silicon Valley Bank for most people. The fear is of contagion. Is this a symptom of a bigger problem? And we will get to that in depth here on on this video, but overall, I don't think so. And we're going to go over and we're going to look at the portfolio of Silicon Valley Bank. We're going to look at why they ran into this trouble. We're going to look at the other two banks just briefly and take a look. So the fear is of contagion. Now, as of this morning or last evening, I'm not sure which, the elites, Janet Yellen namely, said that everybody's going to be okay and they're going to cover the deposits. And this will not be a taxpayer funded bailout. Well, that is a lie (laughs) because there are two types of taxes in this country. There is the basic tax we're all familiar with. When we think of taxes, we think of income taxes. Of course, there are many other taxes, sales taxes, et cetera, et cetera. There's a million taxes. But what few people think about is the inflation tax. And this is going to create even more inflationary pressure. And the Fed is in a very tight spot. And we are going to talk about how they can get out of it and what they're probably going to do, what that government reaction will be. But first, in the interest of, I guess, full disclosure, I will tell you, I used to be a customer of Silicon Valley Bank about 20 years ago. Well, I guess 20 three years ago, I was working on a startup, which I still think is a fantastic idea, one of my many fantastic ideas, and I haven't seen anybody do this startup yet, but it was right at the tail end of the dot-com bubble, and I remember I opened up an account at Silicon Valley Bank with a few hundred thousand dollars, and I just kind of remember the sort of the vibe I got being their customer, which I would not say was entirely positive. (laughs) I thought they were pretty elitist. And at that time, they were riding on a huge wave and really that turned into a huge bubble of money flowing into the tech sector. That was the first dot com bubble. And we all know what happened. It was an absolute disaster and an absolute crash. And then we have been in another one the past few years. And it is so sad and really unfair the way our world works when it comes to capital formation, because all of these venture capitalists, all of the capital pretty much, it wants to flow toward these highly scalable technology companies. And just like it was 23 years ago, and just like it is today, I saw so many companies that were just the 
stupidest idea. You just knew, well, I did at least, knew that these companies would never make any money. They never had a real path to profit. They never had a real business. But at that time, because they just put dot com after their name <laughs> at the end of their name if they were a dot com like that stupid sock puppet in the super bowl commercial back then and all the rest they would be big and all the money would flow toward them and we saw this happen remember just a couple of years ago with the nft craze the non-fungible tokens everybody thought that was going to revolutionize the world and there was a tea company that turned themselves into like an nft or something i can't remember i reported on this story a couple of years ago i don't remember the details and all this money flowed in and it, it folks it is amazing to me how silly the marketplace is and how mature humans. I mean, look, I've said it before. There are so many children walking around the world in adult bodies. It is truly shocking. It really is shocking. And they fall for these things. Just read the books on it. You know, what is it called? History of Manias. And I mean, there's so many books. I've reported on those books before. We've interviewed a few of the authors over the years too. But look at all of the manias and all of the craziness that is unfolded throughout history. And it just, it really just should amaze all of us at how silly some of these ideas are. And, you know, people would be so much better off investing in one of my companies, not that I'm taking any investment because I'm not offering anything to investors, but you know, my businesses actually make real money and have real products and services versus some of these, these tech companies that are just a house of cards. They're not exactly, but they're sort of a version of a Ponzi scheme, if you will. They just don't have a real business. So the fear is contagion right? And here's Jerome Powell. This is a funny meme. If you're watching on video here, you know, we had the crypto collapse. We had Alameda. Y'all heard about that one. We all had FTX. You definitely all heard about that one. And then there was Silvergate last week and also Signature Bank as of, I believe yesterday, Silicon Valley Bank as of last Friday. So is this a domino? Is this going to lead to more bank failures? That is the question. And look, the Fed has backed themselves into a corner. Silicon Valley Bank really was an okay bank not too long ago. But when we saw these radical increases by the Fed, because they waited way too long, I've told you about my criticism of the Fed, they waited way too long to hike rates. Jerome Powell was massively in denial, as he was saying inflation is transitory. Now, of course, like most lies and most jokes, you know, the old saying is, there's a little bit of truth in every joke. And there's a little bit of truth in every lie. Yes, there was some component of transitory. I, I mean, of course, I'm going to give him credit for that. We all know the supply chain issues and so forth. But overall, when we could all see the writing was on the walls, it was so obvious that there was this massive tidal wave of money in the markets. And really, there still is a pretty big tidal wave of money, but it's moving around. It's not in the same places. And it was chasing that very limited supply of goods and services. And so that created real and, as we now see, very sustained and sustainable, not in a good way for most of the economy, usually sustainable is a positive thing, inflation. And so now, you know, there are all kinds of traps that the Fed has put themselves into. One of the traps, and, and you'll see on the screen, the choice is which button does Jerome Powell push? Does he push the button for runaway inflation? Or does he push the button for banking system collapse? Now, that's a little overreaching, of course, but it's not completely untrue. And here's why. Okay, well, 
Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. So I went to Silicon Valley Bank's website, and of course it says, you know, the FDIC took it over. And just a couple of memes and quick quotes here before we get to their portfolio, which is going to be very enlightening. And we're going to also look at the portfolios of a whole bunch of banks. Okay, so this one, somehow Silicon Valley Bank managed to play under a different set of rules than other FDIC banks. They managed to push the envelope and get away with making loans that not 99% of banks would never touch. And those were the loans to these overfunded tech companies, these silly tech companies that were just copycats of something in the physical, tangible world. They were sharing economy ideas that, you know, we just don't need. And so much of the sharing economy has not figured out a way to make any money yet. These companies, we've seen it with the layoffs and the, uh, I'll call them austerity measures, at these tech companies, these people that were just enjoying these lavish jobs, they were totally overpaid, getting all these perks and goodies. And this is the poison, the poison of too much money. In my businesses, they are run like real businesses. They are prudent, they are logical, they analyze risk carefully, and they actually, for the most part, make very nice profits. So, you know, this is like a different world. These companies do not function in the real world and neither does their main bank, Silicon Valley Bank, okay? Now, let's talk about Signature Bank, okay? Signature Bank gets shuttered by regulators after the Silicon Valley Bank collapse and that is another major blow. Then let's look at Silvergate. Just earlier in the week, I'm kind of jumping around here on the time frame, but it, hey, it's only by a few days. We're all talking the same time period here, right? Silvergate adds, and this was as of uh, about fourth quarter of last year, adds 48 new crypto clients in the fourth quarter despite a 55% decline in net income. And Silvergate Capital Corporation that owns the bank announces its intent to wind down operations and voluntarily liquidate Silvergate Bank. And it raised to cover $8.1 billion of withdrawals during the cryptocurrency meltdown. And that's nothing compared to Silicon Valley Bank. Much, much bigger failure. But here's the important thing. Here's the document I really want you to look at. Now, this document is very telling because it shows us the portfolios of these banks. So when it comes to Silicon Valley Bank, here was their biggest problem. They were so stupid that they bought a whole bunch of mortgage-backed securities during the time when we saw the lowest interest rates in history. And these didn't pay very well. And they were assets that really did not work very well. Well, they don't work very well because the, the, the coupon rate on them is very low, but they also are meant to be held to maturity. So HIM, hold to maturity, that's the acronym. Sorry if that bothers the feminist. It's him is the acronym. I'm I'm sure there's some acronyms with H E R or you know whatever, right? <laughs> so uh, these are hold to maturity type of assets. And just looking at the top of this chart, I'm showing you now. If you're looking on video, if you're if you're watching, say on YouTube, fifty seven percent of the securities of Silicon Valley Bank were basically in the agency mortgage backed securities, sixty four percent, and the agency commercial mortgage-backed securities, 14%. So a huge percentage of their investment portfolio, and by the way, you should go to jasonhartman.com and look up our old podcast that we've done. We've done several podcasts over the years about Glass-Steagall. And this was a very important change in the way the system works and the way banks work study Glass-Steagall, okay? That's, that led to a lot of this, and maybe it will lead to contagion. We will see. All right, so that's the problem. Now, what all the analysts are doing, and I believe they're making a huge mistake with this, is they're saying, okay, well, if Silicon Valley Bank needed to create capital 
very quickly by selling these him securities that they should have held to maturity, but they couldn't because they basically had a couple of runs on the bank. And then they had the big run on the bank just at the end of last week. And that forced them to shut down. They had to sell them at big, big losses. Now, why did they have to do that? Well, the Fed hiked rates a whole bunch. And all of these rates went up so high, making the value of these prior low rate securities go down. See, these are inverse, right? When the bond market rallies, we see interest rates go down. And when the bond market tanks, we see interest rates go up, right? So, so these are inverse things, right? And so they were forced to sell these quickly. They couldn't hold them to maturity and they had to take huge losses. So what everybody else is doing is they're saying, well, now that that killed Silicon Valley Bank, how much of these types of securities, these hold to maturity securities are other banks holding, right? That's the concern. And the percentages in some cases are pretty big. Let's look at the chart. So here's the ticker symbol of all these different banks. And you see the next one in line is holding, or the next two in line holding 42%, then 41%, goes down into the 37% range, you know, down and down and down, right? Okay, well, what is the concern here? What if they need to raise capital? What if they need to do that quickly? Okay, if they do, they could be in trouble. But here's what this chart that is floating all over the internet right now does not tell you. I mean, I have seen so many people tweet this chart. What doesn't it tell you? Always ask yourself about the dogs that don't bark. Because remember, you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. Well, this might tell you the percentage of these securities that the bank is vested in. But what it doesn't tell you is when they bought them. So you don't know what the rate is on that security. For example, what if they purchased these in 2019 or 2018 when interest rates were much higher? The unspoken assumption here with this chart is that all of these securities were purchased at the time we saw the lowest rates in history during the COVID era. And the answer is, I don't know, because you would have to look at the blended rate of all of those securities that are being held by these banks. And, you know, I'm not a bank analyst, okay? I don't claim to be an expert in any of this stuff. I'm just giving you the sort of lay person's view of it. So that's what you don't know. So when you hear all of this fear mongering out here about, oh my God, the banking system is going to collapse. I'm going to get the most clicks on YouTube because I'm saying the banking system is going to collapse, right? The clickbait, fear mongering, chicken little sky is falling stuff really has to be taken with a grain of salt because the chart does not tell you, and this is the chart like everybody's talking about right now. I mean, just go to Twitter. You'll see it all over the place. The same exact chart I'm showing you. And they don't know the dates the securities were purchased. They don't know the rates on these securities and they don't know the maturity dates. So you cannot just imply, and look, all of the banks are holding lower percentages than SVB did. So that's good. But again, we don't know when they purchased these. And of course they didn't buy them all at once. They bought them in tranches. And so you would have to average them kind of do the dollar cost averaging on them and look at the blended rate of all those and the maturity dates to know when they mature because remember they're hold to maturity style assets that are best held to maturity and so if they're maturing quickly they can just sell them at maturity and they you know they got their money so that this is the problem with the, these drive-by soundbite type analyses you see out there. And again, I'm not saying I'm an expert. I'm definitely not an expert on this, but I understand the concept uh, of that, right? And that's that's what I want you to get to understand. So I'm interviewing Alf from Twitter. He is going to be on the show today. We'll probably air that show on Wednesday because he's done a lot of deep analysis into the banks and Silicon Valley Bank. So I think he's going to be a great guest. I reached out to him yesterday, but this is basically the thing. I, I mean, he had a whole bunch of tweets, but I like this one. He says, a $120 billion bond portfolio 
with a 5.6 year duration means that every 10 basis points move higher in five year interest rate lost the bank $700 million. If that's 200 bips, that's $14 billion in economic loss. Basically, the entire bank's capital just totally wiped out. So does that give you a sense of what happened? Okay, now, here is another very interesting chart. And, you know, consider the source. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it's noticed. You always got to do that, right? But this chart is loans plus securities as a percentage of deposits. Now, we got to remember something. We might all think of a deposit as an asset. But to a bank, remember, their balance sheet is the inverse of our balance sheet. A deposit to a bank is a liability. A loan is an asset. It goes the opposite way of the way we think of it in our lives. So we have to just understand it's kind of like taking a photograph and in one of those photo editing programs, just flipping it. Sometimes people do this to my picture and it quite annoys me. I don't part my hair on that side. It parts the other way. You know? <laughs> so Anyway, it's like flipping the view of it, right? So lower risk deposit base, we got JP Morgan over here, right? Saying they're low risk. And of course, the bigger banks have more diversification, right? But <laughs> Silicon Valley Bank's investment group, right? Their parent company had really, really high risk, as you see on this chart. And clearly, we all know what happened by now as of just a few days ago. But that gives you an idea as to what's going on. But again, you got to know the maturity date. Now, let's talk about woke culture for a minute and how these companies, I mean, especially Another company that just totally bugs me, and we talked about its CEO and founder on the show when I interviewed the author of The Davos Man. Very interesting. Go back and listen to that show on The Davos Man and talking about Davos, Switzerland, the World Economic Forum, and all these elitist hypocrites following all of these woke ideals. And, you know, th this is not business. Look, my general philosophy is this. The corporation is not anybody's babysitter. The corporation is not meant to pursue causes, charities, woke ideology, or any ideology, as conservative or woke. The corporation is there to do business. That's what corporations are for. If you want a babysitter, you've got the government. <laughs> well, the government shouldn't be the babysitter either, the cradle-to-grave babysitter. But we have what we have, so you know. I'm pragmatic about that stuff. Okay, so from Forbes, Kurt, thank you for sending this article over over the weekend. From Forbes, Silicon Valley Bank proxy shows the board's secret year-long risk panic. And in this article, there are some bullet points, but I thought this one was really interesting. Perhaps most troubling is uh, that it seems Silicon Valley Bank astonishingly operated much of 2022 without a chief risk officer. Okay, so no CRO with these you know, hundreds of billions of dollars they're playing with, no risk officer. On January 4th, 2023, SVB announced the hiring of Kim Olson as its CRO, the subsequently released 2023 proxy statement, yada, 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 right? And here's what's interesting. You look at the UK branch of SVP, okay, which was purchased, by the way, by HBC, I, I think, bought them uh, over the weekend. I mean, these, can you imagine how busy the lawyers and the bankers were this weekend? It must have been just crazy. And Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell, too, much as I disagree with them on pretty much everything. Although I used to like Powell, but I think he really, he really messed this up. So look at this one. Jay, and I don't know how to pronounce this last name, Erza. Pa, head of financial risk management and model risk Silicon Valley Bank UK Limited. This is the distraction of wokeness, right? A head of risk management at Silicon Valley Bank spent considerable time spearheading multiple woke LBGTQ plus programs, including a quote, safe space for coming out stories as the firm raced towards collapse. Okay, and Jay, whatever the last name is, the boss of financial risk management at SVP's UK branch launched 
initiatives, such as the company's first month-long pride campaign and a new emphasizing mental health awareness for LGBTQ. Now, look, folks, I'm a libertarian. I think everybody should be able to pretty much do what they want as long as they're not hurting anybody else. I have no problem with, you know, people having different sexualities or whatever, right? That's not the issue. The issue is this is a corporation. They should be focused in a corporation with giant problems, giant problems looming in the background. And here they're distracted with this crazy woke stuff. Companies should not be involved in any of this stuff at all. It's not their thing. It's not what companies are supposed to do. We've just got to move away from this idea of companies getting involved in social programs, in even in charity. You know, this is not what companies do. I mean, look, I donate money to charity, right? You never hear me talk about it. I have a foundation I started way back in 2005, you know, 18 years ago. You really never hear me talk about it. You know, this is not business, right? That's other stuff. That's uh, philanthropy is fine, you know, but that's not what businesses are for. Okay. Oh, there's so much to cover here. It's it's just beyond the beyond. But look, I want to get to what can you do about it? Okay, so let me just speed forward a little bit. A couple of memes and tweets that I think, you know, you know what's great about memes and tweets and poems and song lyrics is they say, in quotes, they say a lot of stuff in a very small package. <laughs> so I think they're they're very helpful sometimes. So this one was interesting. Quick explainer on what's going on, the fiat Ponzi system. They turned off the money printer, either it restarts or everything collapses, the end. And that's what I presented to you toward the beginning of this episode, where I said, look, you know, the two buttons that Powell can push, right? The Fed has to push the button. We're just going to continue with inflation or the button. We're going to let everything fall apart. Because remember, the point being that not only Silicon Valley Bank and not only the other banks we talked about, but a lot of other people and institutions are holding even as a proxy, as a derivative, they are holding and attached to these mortgage securities. And as such, those have been massively devalued. Remember back to the Great Recession. Remember back to 2007, 2008, right? What was the phrase you heard all the time that you probably never heard before that? Mark to market. You heard the phrase mark to market over and over again. And that's a, one of the dangers of this quick increase in rates where you don't let the price discovery happen and the owners of those securities let them mature, let them sell them off. If they're taking losses, take them gradually instead of suddenly. And that's why the Fed has just screwed this up so badly because it can't tame inflation and it can't raise rates anymore. And well, I'll tell you what I believe is, well, I'll just tell you now. I was gonna wait till the end for this, but I think the Fed has got to pivot. They have got to, you know, they're, the thinking was that they're gonna raise rates again at this next meeting and then that would be it. I think they need to lower the rates and we'll see what they do. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. So here's another tweet. The implosion of SBV bank is not the start of contagion or bank runs far from it. This was, you know, they were into the ESG. We talked about that and DEI maniacs. That's not dissimilar from FDX and Sam Bankman fried, just awful, essentially non-existent rich risk management, but also a California bank, AKA no surprise. So you're in woke California. You got woke causes, big distractions, not focusing, not keeping your eye on the ball, just complete silliness. And we do have to point out that the inimitable Jim Cramer was recommending Silicon Valley Bank just last month. Yep, yeah, buy some shares of Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> he was recommending it, you know? Oh my gosh. CNBC's Jim Cramer urged viewers to buy shares of Silicon Valley Bank just last month. 
last month. So that's the financial advice you get on TV. Now, let's just kind of look at these bank failures. So of course, throughout the time of the Great Recession, we had a whole bunch of bank failures. I believe at the time there were about 8,000 banks in the US and 500 of them failed within just a six year period. I remember I had money at a bunch of banks back then because the limit was $100,000 each. And so I would spread it around. Now they did during the Great Recession increase the FDIC insurance limit to 250. So, you know, just some money that I was keeping on the sidelines. I know you're going to, I'm going to get some hate on this. Look, folks, you got to keep some money in the bank sometimes. Okay. So I use banks and I had my money spread out in a bunch of banks, hundred thousand dollars each. Right. And I remember getting letter after letter after letter saying the FDIC took this bank over, you know, your money is now at this other bank. They moved it and you know, you got to go there. And I got like seven of those letters. I remember during the great recession. So Washington mutual, of course, the biggest bank failure in us history, assets of $307 billion. Now, you got to adjust that for inflation, of course, which I this chart probably does not do. So that 307 billion would be a lot more today, 15 years later, and Silicon Valley Bank, $209 billion in assets. So this is a big deal. This is a big bank failure, the second largest in US history. And here is the run on the bank. This chart depicts it just beautifully, right? So you saw all of these inflows of money, okay, in each quarter of each of these years. And then you started to see the outflows of money last year, okay? Inflows turned into outflows in the past year as clients burned cash amid the tech slowdown. Now, if these companies weren't overfunded in the beginning, if investors put money into like normal boring businesses, like, I don't know, a steel mill, small businesses, you know, there's a lot of other things you can do, but no, everybody's looking for that home run. They want to be in that tech startup, right? And so that's where all the capital goes. Unfortunately, capital formation is one of the biggest problems in today's world. It's a complete mess the way it works. And I don't know that it's ever going to change because it's just human nature, right? But then we saw $42 billion with a B in attempted withdrawals just on March 9th alone. Like, that is shocking. It's so shocking it needs sound effects. (laughs) Now, this was a huge concern until yesterday or this morning. Look at the amount of insured deposits versus the amount of uninsured deposits. In other words, these customers of Silicon Valley Bank with massive amounts of money in the bank, way over $250,000 per account. Folks, do not pass go. Do not collect $200 before you do what I'm about to say to protect your assets. I'm going to give you a couple of strategies on that. Keep listening. It's coming. So let's look at these bank failures just for a moment. This chart illustrates it differently. Washington Mutual, 2008, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, Continental Illinois Bank and Trust, IndyMac, you remember all hearing about IndyMac, that was another biggie during the Great Recession, but by today's scale, looks pretty small uh, because you have these others that have come in play. And you can see the amount of assets and the amount of deposits. And remember, deposits to a bank are a liability. That's not an asset. It's the opposite of the way we think of it. You always have to flip that. And First Republic Bank, you know, they have been after me for quite a few years. You know, come over, bring your money over to First Republic, you know, private bank. You know, we really serve the wealthy people and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I never banked there, but we'll see. So, of course, we all know the FDIC limit, $250,000. So what do you need to do today, right now, folks? You need to get more vestings available. You may not need this today. You don't know when you might need it. But remember, if you have a bunch of different entities, each entity can be insured separately so you have more insurance. This is the way the rich do it. And of course, diversify where you bank. Don't bank all at one place. However, you know, that's not very convenient. 
right? It's convenient to bank at one bank or just a couple of banks, right? It's more convenient. So you gotta weigh convenience versus risk. And the way to solve that problem, at least partially, is to save $250,000. $250,000. That's that's kind of snarky. It's a joke because that's the amount of the insurance. By checking out our free class on asset protection, CYA, cover your assets, protect your assets, save taxes, plan your estate, go to jasonhartman.com slash protect. That's jasonhartman.com slash protect and listen to the uh, free class I did with our affiliate attorney, and he explains a lot of these strategies. You must do this. This is easy. It is cheap, but it must be done in advance. Must be done in advance. There's no other way. JasonHartman.com slash protect. Okay, so what else can you do? Well, we know this is the decision facing the Federal Reserve, and it's also the decision they have to weigh out in terms of the general economy, not just about the banks or about, really, it's much more broad than the banks. It's all holders or people affected by, even through derivatives or knock-on effects, people who are affected by the hold to maturity style assets, right? And even if they do hold them to maturity, They're not going to get enough money out of them because in this climbing rate environment, they're getting beat up by those low rate securities that they bought during the COVID era. So this is a big decision that the the system has to make, that the Federal Reserve especially has to make. But we know that as of the last 24 hours, we know what the decision was. The decision was to bail out Silicon Valley Bank. So what does that mean? Well, they just circumvented the FDIC insurance. They said, we don't care. We don't care what the law is. We don't care what the statute says. We're going to protect the depositors. Okay. And then they have the nerve to say it's not a taxpayer funded bailout like some of the other bailouts were during the Great Recession. (laughs) But of course it is. Any taxpayer who has money, stocks, bonds, savings is going to pay for this through inflation. So what can we do? Well, we use my inflation-induced debt destruction strategy, and I'll get to that in a moment. But I want to tell you what else will probably happen. I talked about the Fed pivot and that I think they should pivot. They need to pivot. They need to be less concerned about inflation. There's no winning here, folks. It's just the lesser of two evils. That's all they can do at this point. And they need to be more concerned about the securities holders and so many other things in the economy, right? So many other things. So this was interesting. Let's begin with the banking sector. Authorities closed down Silicon Valley Bank, as well as the Crypto Focus Signature Bank. All deposits will be made whole. Well, the US Treasury says it's not a bailout because investors are wiped out. The move creates a moral hazard for large depositors. Folks, this is so hazard everything we've talked about is moral hazard everywhere you look, okay? As we talked about earlier, the bank, the UK division was sold to HSBC for one pound. (laughs) What a deal. You can buy this whole huge bank for pretty much nothing. The Fed has set up the bank term funding program, okay? So these banks can borrow to make sure they stay solvent, okay? Now, what's interesting here is this chart. This is the two-year treasury yield, and it is plummeting. (laughs) I mean, just plummeting. So I believe the pivot's going to happen. I could be wrong. You know, I can't control Powell and the FOMC, but that's probably going to happen. And it's going to take a surprisingly resilient housing market and put more fire under it. And the housing market is going to get a boost from this. And inflation, sadly, or positively, depending on how you're investing, and if you're using my inflation-induced debt destruction strategy, is going to get a boost. Or at least it won't be tamed anytime soon. And this is probably what the future looks like. So inflation-induced debt destruction allows you to get your debts, especially long-term fixed-rate mortgage debt, 
literally paid off by inflation. Remember, we are already right now officially in an era of negative interest rates. Now, they're not as negative as they used to be, meaning we get paid to borrow, but they are still negative officially. And since the inflation rate unofficially is so much higher than the CPI number, the, the official reported number, we get huge negative interest rates where we are being paid a giant sum, maybe 10% if real inflation is 15 to 17% and we're borrowing between 5 and 7%, depending on whether or not we're using buy downs on our mortgages or the builder is giving us a buy down or the seller, we are getting paid 10% to borrow the money, assuming we don't even get income from the property. That is a miracle. But the likelihood that inflation will persist and the likelihood that inflation might even get worse, at least unofficially, because without the CPI manipulation, we all know what the truth is, gives us even more benefits from my inflation-induced debt destruction strategy. So take advantage of this and be ready because if we see lower rates, we're already going to take a housing market with very low inventory and kick that up and give it a boost. And uh, remember, these linear markets that we recommend investing in have fared extremely well. Well, the housing statistics, especially in the case Schiller index, that are 75% cyclical markets are showing decline as to be expected, but they are putting too much weight on the statistics. So that keeps people from knowing what's really going on in the housing market. When it comes to entry level housing in the linear markets, bread and butter houses that make good rental properties, those houses are doing great. It's not an overpriced property in Los Angeles, my hometown where I grew up. So big difference. Remember, all real estate is local. The U.S. has nearly 400 metropolitan areas. It has over 3,100 counties and over 9,000 cities and countless neighborhoods beyond that. All real estate is local. So reach out to our investment counselors for help on that. Go to jasonhartman.com or follow me on any social media. Reach out to us and we'll be glad to help you design a safe portfolio that takes advantage of the possibility of lower rates, higher inflation, and borrowing money from the bank rather than keeping money in the bank where it's more at risk. All right, this could go on for a long time today, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you for listening. JasonHartman.com, happy and safe investing to all, and we will talk to you on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.